interactive Zoom webinars that range in time from, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour and 15. So I, I feel like I just got to point out that we, we, we do tend to run long, but you can come and join at any point. And if anyone would like to reach me, my email is there. Thank you to the Gregory's um, um, and your generous support of Michigan Tech and our students. If anyone would like to um, give to Michigan Tech to support student scholarships, that's how you do it. Um, just go to www.mtu.edu slash give now. So I'm getting some chatter. It's, why don't you guys hit your mute buttons to see if it's coming from one of you? Um, okay, that seems to solve it. And, um, and if you would like your gift acknowledged, just let us know by sending an email to engineering at MTU. If you're a K-12 educator, welcome so much. Um, these are good for Michigan Tech sketches. And if you are a um, student or a parent in the state of Michigan, and you want to make this uh, um, opportunity avail known to one of your, your teachers, you might just um, send um, or you know, send them a quick, short email or send me an email and introduce me to them and I'd, I'd be happy to explain it to them. So these are basically professional education credits and our season is winding up, but we're already starting to plan for fall. And so for fall, they might be able to get up to 12 sketches, which, um, and we might be able to engage their class in, um, in some of the activities we're doing here at Michigan Tech. Right, if you ever miss these, please know that we, we post these at, at mtu.edu slash huskybytes. And of course, we're, we're, we're live streaming this now on Facebook. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Oh my goodness, so this is such an exciting week. Um, so does um, Expo, Virtual Design Expo 2021, this is the second year it's been virtual, uh, is going on this week. And so if you would like to see some of the um, senior projects and enterprise projects that our students have been doing, I encourage you to register. Um, you will really enjoy seeing some of these student projects. Um, it, you know, life improving um, undergraduate student projects on display uh, here at Michigan Tech at Design Expo. Um, just a couple of other quick things. Registration for summer youth programs open. Um, please be aware that, that if you're an alumnus or, um, or your parents were an alumni, um, that uh, your children are eligible for um, the uh, in-state tuition pricing, uh, which is called the Alumni Legacy Award. So we're coming to the end of our season. As, um, I'm you know, looking forward to summer, but also um, I've enjoyed so much meeting all, all these faculty and students, but the very last one uh, is featuring um, Jared Wolf, who is, who is a professor in the College of Forest Resources and Environmental Sciences. And he is an expert on, on birds and bird migration and their coloration and you know, conservation and, and so many other things. And so he asked for the last one in the season because it would correspond most closely with the time of bird migration in our area. And uh, so the, the co-host will be Eric Johnson, who is with Audubon, uh, Louisiana. And so I'm really looking forward to learning um, a, a lot more than I, I probably already know about birds. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and um, who, who's up first? I think it's Kit. So while you're loading your slides, Kit, um, actually, let me stop share. Um, skip. Did I stop sharing? I think I did. Yep, yep. All right, so while I'm doing that, I would like to introduce this evening's co-host, who is um, uh, Kit. Sishki, uh, who is one of our faculty members in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, Dr. Sishki earned his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering at Michigan Tech in 01, seems like a long time ago, Kit, uh, a master's at University of Minnesota Twin Cities in Computer Engineering, and then uh, uh, his PhD is in progress here. So I guess Dr. Sishki is soon to be. He is one of our um, strong faculty members uh, and he is the advisor, the faculty advisor to the wireless communications enterprise. A famous fact about Kit is he loves to ride bikes. Um, every kind of bike you can imagine, winter, summer, road, mountain. Um, and so with that, Kit, I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, take it from here. Okay, well, thanks for, for joining us tonight. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, if you didn't read the, the blog, part of the, kind of the uh, thing that got me to Michigan Tech in the first place was my friends in high school got me into uh, 
uh, Star Trek. And um, and I, honestly, part of the reason that I kind of got involved in Enterprise was it was the name of my favorite fictional starship. Um, and so that kind of gives us the, the title for what we're talking about here, that no notion of students boldly going where, where no one's gone before, where, where they haven't done things before. So um, one of my day, uh, one of my jobs here is is in being the advisor for the enterprise, and got a few students who are going to be joining us to tell you a little bit more about kind of how they experience things. So um, <clears throat> you can't see the screen. Uh, I thought I shared it. Let's uh, make sure we're sharing the right thing. Still anything? Now we're seeing a blank black screen. No questions or anything? No, uh, there's no, there's no slides. It's just a black screen. All right. Maybe we have a, a new laptop. And so maybe uh, it's not real happy to be um, uh, sharing screen yet. All right. So Ken or Abby, do you guys have the same slide deck? Yeah, I've got it. I can share. Abby, why don't you why don't you be the driver tonight? Let's sure. See. Let's see. So, um, Abby and uh, Ken and Michael, hi, Michael, are all, all students here at Tech. And so, Abby, thanks so much for so. Go ahead and share your screen. All right, now we got it. That's it. Right. Yeah. You're the driver. There we go. Um, so I'm Kitsishki, the one that currently can't work technology. And then uh, you'll hear from Abby and Ken and Michael in just a little bit. So head to the next one. Um, so here's the question that I would uh, throw out to you uh, to start with. And, I, and we do have a poll for this one. Um, of the following projects that you see listed here, which would you think were worked on by the wireless communications enterprise? So one is uh, option A is a system to measure the batteries in hybrid electric vehicles and wirelessly transmits the parameters to the central brain of the car. B is designing a website for scheduling volunteers for a nonprofit organization. C is an app uh, that runs on like an Android smartwatch that gives you step-by-step -step baking instructions. And D, designing an LED street light powered entirely by renewable energy sources. See lots of lots of things coming in. Wow, lots of votes. So the primary ones we're seeing definitely uh, the wireless battery monitoring um, and then the renewable street light. Those ones are big. Not quite as much on the uh, the websites or the smartwatch app. Fifty-two percent. What's the answer? What's the answer? The answer is all of them, um, and that's uh, that's what's really interesting about the enterprise is that it's not just any one of these kinds of things. It's a whole bunch of different things that um, that we do. So all of them are things that, um, that the, the enterprise does. So next one. Um, so we, we talked just a little bit about this before the, um, as things were starting. And um, what, what I remember is I was working in Rochester, Minnesota on, in, at IBM on their hard drives. And uh, a faculty member in electrical engineering named Dr. David Stone had was pitching this idea of a thing called enterprise. It was supposed to match the technical aspects of engineering with the entrepreneurial aspects of engineering. And between the fact that for some reason I didn't have a super big interest in senior design and they called it enterprise, which sounded cool just on account of because, it was like, yes, I wanna do that, I'm in. Uh, let's let's go, um, and it it was it's really astonishing to think back and to be thinking 
over those first couple of years, it was a lot of just figuring out what are we doing? What are we doing here? Um, and go ahead on the next slide. Like, what is the, the value add to our departments, um, you know, to the university? You know, what, what were we doing and how were we doing it? Um, and I don't know that I can point back and be like, hey, uh, WCE fundamentally changed my life or it made it so that I got all of the, the jobs that I've ever gotten. But there are a couple of crucial lesson, lessons that I really remember that I picked up there. And um, one, I remember we were given a project update and it was like, yeah, we're waiting on this other team to, to give us something or to tell us something. And, we're, and Dr. Stone was like, nope, don't wait. You got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. Um, there was a point where someone was getting uh, a little frustrated and there was an email that came across from Dr. Stone again. We don't get mad first, last, or ever. That's, that's, you don't, you keep your emotions in check when you're doing that. And, um, and a big thing about owning both your successes and your failures and making sure that those things uh, are both happening, uh, which were really crucial to me in terms of growing professionally. Next. And so, you know, something that you can, uh, I'll ask actually all the students, um, but also something that I would love to hear from our, uh, the folks in the audience is, what was the best piece of professional advice that you ever received? You can type that into Q&A if you like. Yeah, into the Q&A or, and, uh, you know, Abby and Ken, and Michael. Yes, and so the Q&A is how we ask questions and communicate with the audience and you can add them in at any point and we'll answer them kind of toward the end probably is when we'll answer them so uh, during my several years here at tech I think the best piece of professional advice anyone has ever um, given me was um, to talk to recruiters and to talk to the people at the companies, even though I may not be exactly qualified for whatever position, just get my name um, in their memory and my and um, to not be shy about talking to um, the recruiters because uh, they come back every year and, and they recognize faces. And so I think that is one of the reasons um, why I got my co-op and my internships um, was because of um, my initiative to go go and talk, even though I knew I wasn't going to get anything at career fair, um, just go and talk to recruiters. Yeah, I think uh, for something that I had learned, I, I learned this in this enterprise from Kit, actually, it's the one piece of advice he gave about, uh, you know, not waiting on people and just going forward and doing things. Because one of the projects I had a couple years ago, uh, basically, some of the data we needed to move forward was uh, confidential. And so we talked to you know the Department of Defense that we were working with asking for it. And they said, oh, uh, go ask these guys for it. And then we went and asked those guys. And three weeks later, they got back to us and said, uh, we don't actually have that. You got to go ask these people. And we just bounced back and forth for a while until we decided, like, OK, we, we need to just go forward and do things. Like, we shouldn't be waiting on other people to get this information. We're going to do the best of what we can. And then if they tell us different things later, we'll change what we've done and update it afterwards. Well, and, and Michael, if you want to add something, um, go ahead. But well, I'm going to read off some of the some of the um, input from our audience. So, um, uh, what one anonymous attendee says: "You either win or you learn." <laughs> Daniel says, "Don't let your emotions get the best of you." Walt says, "Stay positive and move forward." Harry uh, says, "When put in charge." take charge and get things done. Jeffrey says, trust your work if you did it carefully and listen to everyone. And then another anonymous, it doesn't matter how you think you are doing nor actually how well you do. It is only important what others perceive. <laughs> this is the cornerstone of why communication is so very important. And for me, I would just say, fear not, fear not, you know. So Michael, from you. I'm still thinking of what the best advice might be. It's not yeah. the mind right now. All right, back to you, Kit. All right, next slide. 
I think this is, uh, oh, so just to kind of put things in perspective, I think we had uh, the first meeting of the wireless communications enterprise was just in a classroom in the ERC. There was like 30 of us and we didn't have any real workspace. We didn't have any real direction other than we're, we got to figure this out. We're going to, we're going to make something cool. And uh, um, even by the time that I came back on faculty, like five years later, um, the difference was night and day. There was a lab facility, there was organization, there was direction, there was external sponsorship. It was, it was amazing. Um, and the, the sense of ownership that students have in this organization is what I can't, I can't get over because um, we had this super long standing relationship with Ford for like five years when, when other when Ford couldn't, wasn't able to allocate money to other student projects, they were able to allocate money to us because one student was like, hey, I'm do, finishing up my summer internship. Hey, you want to do some projects with the enterprise? And they just kept coming back and back and back. And that's constantly something that happens. And so we have this organization that looks like a contract engineering firm, really. Um, uh, we have... Uh, president, uh, like president, vice president, we have people, we have project managers on project teams, and it all works really, really well. And the, I don't want to say the best part, but one of the better parts is that I don't have to micromanage what's going on. The students are the ones that run it. Good. But it's not all just, uh, <clears throat> it's not all work. Um, this when I get up to talk, they have the uh, the amazingly photoshopped kit says videos or um, little pictures, and uh, <clears throat> it just shows you the kind of relationship that the students and advisor have in this particular organization. <laughs> uh, so I think the next one, hopefully, uh, if the sound doesn't come through, I'll well, I'll narrate. So I'm not hearing it, so I'll just keep talking. So this is just a quick tour of kind of the lab. Um, we moved into this space this year and Abby's done a great job getting it set up. We've got a cooler full of pop. It's cheaper than buying it from the vending machines. We've got coffee makers and uh, microwave, stuff like that to try to make the, the, uh, the lab a good place to be. We've got project work from Whirlpool that we're doing. We've got, so we've got two, uh, <laughs> two washing machines in there. We've recently been revamping the, the soldering machine stuff. We've got the big screen TV. Um, this is our new toy, a, a $4,000 PCB machine called a Volterra. And an older uh, PCB fab, that one didn't work quite as well for us, but um, got a ping pong table, just in, in case you, you need to burn off some, uh, some steam there. Lots of other workspace, right? So lots of cubicles where teams can meet. And, um, and actually, uh, we'll walk past him without showing him, but there's a student who spends most of his time uh, just studying here because it's space that's quiet and available. Um, and uh, we also have other cool toys like a 3D printer that uh, <clears throat> are available for students to do the project work on. So. That's, uh, that's part of what we get to, to do with the, uh, the project money is to make sure we've got the equipment to do our job. All righty. So um, that's kind of like an intro thanks kit um, for the enterprise um, as a whole. Uh, my name is Abby Nelson, and um, I'll give a little bit of intro about me and then kind of talk about some of the work that I've done with the enterprise. Um, I am a fifth year computer engineering student. Um, I'm graduating in 11 days. <laughs> and this is my second year in uh, wireless communications, um, non consecutive. So I um, started in the enterprise my second semester, my first year. Um, and then through the first part of my second year, and then I was gone um, in different enterprises and different work around campus, and then I came back for my last year. Um, I am currently the lab manager um, for the enterprise um, and project manager for the wireless battery monitoring system project. 
little bit about um, wireless um, BMS, which is wireless battery monitoring system. This project started last semester in fall of 2020 and was sponsored by Fiat Chrysler Automotive. The purpose of the project was to create a battery monitoring system or BMS that would be able to wirelessly sample information such as state of charge and temperature from any of the battery modules throughout an electric or hybrid vehicle. The current BMS that Fiat had was still hardwired and introduced some errors and timing delays that they wanted cleared up um, because everything was run through wires throughout the whole vehicle. So the first semester of the project, we focused on creating a prototype um, to prove the concept of the project to Fiat and was also um, kind of to prove the project um, to ourselves that we could do it. Um, so we created it using an Arduino, um, a Raspberry Pi, XP cards. Um, these are all um, circuit cards that are um, commonly used for projects um, like ours. And we also built a circuit um, that would kind of integrate with this. We tested this prototype using um, some little rechargeable battery um, that we had around a lab. So a lot of the stuff that we used that first semester was stuff that we found around the lab um, because we have a lot of equipment here um, from past projects and stuff that we've kind of stockpiled so that people can build projects without having to order a whole bunch of stuff um, in the beginning. So this was our first um, prototype. We had our Arduino and XB um, over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse um, on the far left. And then our um, on the bottom left here, um, the battery um, batteries that we used to test um, our, our circuit. And then on the right here, this is a picture of a Raspberry Pi, which is what we used um, as our brain of the system. So the Raspberry Pi would talk to the Arduino wirelessly through um, XP cards. So they're kind of like, they just talk to each other wirelessly, um, almost like Bluetooth, but not quite. Um, so the Raspberry Pi would ask the Arduino, what's the state of charge of the batteries? And then the Arduino would send back a whole bunch of data to the Raspberry Pi. So that cut out the wires um, that Fiat um, was using between the, the brain of the operation and the batteries. This semester, we spent our time finalizing our design and making it more permanent rather than a prototype. So we replaced the breadboard circuit, which is all the little pieces all stuck together with a circuit we printed with the PCB printer, the Volterra here in the lab. Um, it was a lot of learning with the Volterra because it's a new piece of equipment. And so I ended up printing a circuit five times before I got it right. Um, so um, that is one thing kind of in our work in a project, there's a lot of trial and error. Um, obviously, we want to think through things um, and try our best to not have to do it over again. Um, but there's a lot of room for um, our kind of trial and error and, and seeing how things work. Um, and uh, so the rest of the semester, we adapted um, the system to work with the batteries that FCA sent us. So they sent us um, some older vehicle batteries, um, and we were able to use. Um, a fireproof chamber in the sub basement of this room of this building um, and tested the, the state of charge of the cells in that battery. Um, we also updated the, the cards that we were using so we could uh, decrease or increase the time efficiency um, and decrease the time um, of the data reporting. So um, on the left, this is a um, picture of our updated the green card in the middle is the circuit we printed. And then the little batteries we were testing it with, and then that's the Arduino. On the right here, this is the lithium or the FCA battery they sent us. So it's sitting in the fireproof chamber um, in the picture. So we used that um, and connected it all up, and and it worked. So um, yeah, thanks. All right. Of well, course it worked. Of course it worked, Daddy. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, hello, I'm Kenneth Shivers, a fourth year electrical computer engineering student here. Uh, as I think we mentioned this a bit in the, the pre-show or before we started outright, but I've been part of this enterprise since my second semester here. I pretty much joined as soon as tech would let me in. 
So <laughs> uh, currently I'm the project manager for an internal project. It's a LED fan. We'll get to get into it in a second. And then I'm the president for the enterprise uh, from the, the student perspective, so. Well, and, and you're graduating, right? Yes, yes, and I'm graduating this semester. But Abby so. and Ken are graduating. And I, I, Mike, Michael, you have to tell me when you speak later whether you're graduating. But in, And Ken's looking for a job, so pay attention to what he knows how to do, those of you out there. Yeah, uh, Mike should also be graduating this semester, but he's also looking for a job still, so yep. keep that in mind. <laughs> so, yeah, um, so many of you may have seen online uh, these LED fans where they're like these tiny little gadgets, they spin really fast and they have LEDs on the blades. And so those uh, LEDs will turn on and off really fast. And then you can, you know, because of this phenomenon of persistence of vision, where it looks like something is still on after it's, you know, moved away or has been off, uh, you can see numbers in a little clock that displays. So uh, our project idea is to construct one of those, but have it be much bigger around like a 30 inch diameter. And then instead of just having a single LED that displays one color, have an RGB LED so that way we can display any arbitrary picture, uh, you know, because in that image, it's just green LEDs around the outside. So it can only display green. With an RGB LED, we can display any color we want and get a whole, you know, any picture we want displayed on there. So uh, next slide. Uh, in previous semesters, we were focused on, like when we were first starting off, the big idea was like, how do we even approach this? Like when we are prototyping it, do we just try to, you know, tape facilities onto a box fan that we have laying around? How can we go across figuring out what it is we even need to do? We ended up deciding on mostly going with 3D printing for that, for getting our smaller prototype going. Uh, as you saw in the previous video, we have a nice 3D printer in the lab. So that's, uh, and the intro engineering courses here have you go through and learn how uh, NX works in the Engineering 1102 course. So NX is a 3D modeling software similar to SolidWorks or, you know, it's a generic CAD program. So with that, you can, you know, model up things and then 3D print them out and then you can run prototypes with them. So um, that's the physical construction part of it. And then in addition, if we're going to take, you know, a random picture you can have on your phone or on a computer and then turn it into uh, like LEDs on a fan blade, you need some usable format, you know, uh, Normally, if you're you know, using some software, you upload a picture and then it displays it, you know, someone has to write that software. So we have to make that uh, image processing to be able to take a picture, break out the RGB values from each individual pixel, and then change its format into some usable version for us. Uh, in addition, we had to figure out how to control the fan speed in previous semesters. That way, it, you know, if it's spinning too fast or too slow and it changes how fast it's spinning, the image will rotate. You know? So instead of the word saying hello up here, hello might be sideways. So you got to keep a consistent speed so that way when the LEDs turn on and off, it stays in that same spot. Uh, yeah, I think next slide. So this is uh, pretty much one of the best pictures I've gotten of it, of the original prototype we had that was finished at the end of last semester before we started to scale it up. So you can see on the left, that was just an image I drew up that's you know like easy and nice for testing. Because if you have a more complex image with the small amount of LEDs we have and how fast it's spinning, it can be kind of hard to tell what or how is going wrong when you're prototyping. But that one, it's really easy. You know, you can see where the, the yellow X is and the colors. So uh, that picture on the right is pretty much the best picture of what I've gotten. This doesn't appear very well in pictures and in like videos, unless it's spinning really fast. Like uh, the previous picture you saw of the tiny LED fan, those things are really small and spin really, really fast. So if you get just a picture, it's all good. Uh, whereas these, you know, we don't want to spin too fast, especially because it's just out in the open. So, uh, you know, getting a picture is a, a bit of luck for getting it to display that nicely. But uh, we had this at the end of last semester. And so you can see the yellow X. Uh, an interesting thing to note as well is that between the red and the blue side, I'm pointing at my screen. I don't, I can't, <laughs> there's no way for that to translate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, thanks for pointing at it. In between the red and blue sections, there's that purple line there because uh, the way the image processor works is that if the image is much larger than how many pixels you have, it has to average the values to a color. So in between red and blue is where it sampled and then it said, oh, cool, we'll make this purple. So that's a little caveat of how the software works that's intended, so. Uh, a lot of what we've been doing this semester now is making the much larger fan. So uh, that has brought a whole bunch of fun, unexpected problems with it. Uh, you know, you think like, oh, we have all the code working. It's all printed out and small. Uh, you know, if you scale it up, it's, it'll just work. You know, it scales up all easily and read, uh, readily. Uh, it, is, <laughs> it very sadly does not work like that. There's been a lot of uh, emergent issues that have arose. So for example, on that last fan uh, with the our memory limitations of the Arduino, uh, part of the reason we would do all the image processing off the Arduino is that it would you know, take too long and take up too much memory. So we do the converting of a, a real you know, a JPEG or a PNG picture 
like we use BMP files, but we do that conversion on a normal computer and then upload just the, uh, the RGB values. So the Arduino can't store enough RGB values to have like, you know, 100 LEDs all with three values every time it needs to change around. So uh, we have an SD card reader that we have attached to it instead. Uh, but the issue that we have dealing with now is that reading from the SD card reader takes a while. So we've traded this problem of uh, we don't have enough storage for now. We can't do things fast enough, which is like a classic uh, hardware software problem of time complexity versus uh, storage complexity. So we're working now to, to get back to the sweet zone in the center. Uh, hopefully we can or we, we should be able to get that done over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have good ideas for moving forward and we just got to flush it out a bit more. So. Uh, yeah, it's a good review of that. I think the next slide should be a picture and this will be the end. Uh, so on the right is as good as a picture I've gotten with the big fan that spins a bit slower. So you can only see like one purple section where when we were testing on the big fan, we had uh, like half purple, half orange to display it. So there's like a, a purple section of it. You can see uh, on the background, there's a, a magnet. The, the magnet is there. Yeah, there's, there's the magnet that's there. Um, that's there for orienting making sure that like, you know, if we have the words hello, uh, they won't be sideways. So instead of just spinning at a constant speed, we have a, a sensor on it that can detect a magnet. And so every time it senses the magnetic field, it goes, oh, cool, this is like the zero position. And it evens it out. So, and then on the left is the, like a basic circuit diagram of uh, what's set up inside the fan blades, because all of the Arduino, the LEDs, the power for it all needs to be inside the fan blades. Because if they're outside, uh, you know, if it's spinning really fast, the wires get tangled up. Uh, there's ways around that in design with slip rings, which can you can mount it to something, and the bottom wires can stay stationary while the top ones rotate. But uh, I personally am not good enough at 3D design to work that into this. I thought at first it wouldn't be that bad, and then you know you get down into doing it, and you're like, oh, this <laughs> there's a lot of complications here. So I tried it for a while, and then in the end decided uh, it would be more efficient to do this and just have everything on board than designing with a slip ring. So. Uh, I think that's it. So Michael, if you want to just be a little extemporaneous and kind of uh, talk about what you've done in the last year or so with, uh, with WCE. Um, so I joined WCE this last fall. Um, I was on a couple enterprises on campus before that until I joined this one. Um, with WCE this year, I'm working on a project uh, with Next Year Automotive, where we are simulating the the electromagnetic uh, responses of one of their main boards that are used in their steering columns, and seeing what kind of interference comes from its own components, from its own housing, and uh, seeing what kind of response it has as far as uh, filtering signal. Now, when you flick a switch, um, if you were to look at the voltage going to that bulb, it's not just a, a straight power. It, you've got uh, pulses in that. And that switching noise is something that's significant in uh, electronics, especially as far as, as integrity goes over time, how well they they perform how long they last. So we're doing this analysis to see if there are any um, undesired noise aspects of their of the design, as well as ways to simplify the circuit model, such that um, it's uh, easier to manufacture. So just to wrap up our formal stuff before we kind of go into Q and A or whatever. Um, I think it's it's probably a good question to ask, like, how well can something like an experiential program like an enterprise, how can that work really well when you can't be together, when you're not, when we're, we're at, at a distance? Um, and I think that there's there's two things that have made it work really well. One is actually that bottom bullet, the fact that students become tremendously invested in these pro in these projects that they're working on they like the work um I, to a certain extent i don't think that i could have pulled ken off of <laughs> the the led fan project with you know unless i was threatening to fail him he wants he wants to get that done and uh, and student and actually the same thing is true with abby's project she, she wanted to get make it work even when the uh, chrysler was like well we're we 
we don't have the the bandwidth to support you, but we'll 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 keep paying attention to what your project is doing. But she wanted to get it done, and 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 that dedication to getting the projects done due to the student ownership is a big part of what has made it work in general, but also for sure during this this time they want to find ways to get around to do that, do the work and to do it safely. Um, and that drive is is undiminished, even in in the craziness. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to I'm not going to read through the whole list here, but I wanted to give you just kind of an idea of the the breadth of companies that we've done work for. And, you know, sometimes we do internal projects that are, you know, the ultimate goal is, hey, we would like to would love to generate some revenue basing royalty based IP. Um, and, and someday maybe that'll happen, but um, sometimes it's just, hey, what can we learn? What can the students gain by doing something that they just have a passion for? And so companies like this help pay the bills. They also um, get an opportunity to get their names in front of the students and, and to know that they do cool, cool stuff. And um, these are some of the, the folks that we've partnered with in the past. and. Um, you know, would be happy to to add your company's name to it too. Well, and, and often um, it's through an, an alum or you know who's reaching back who might have been in the WCE, but or who might just know about the enterprise or who's just looking for a way to get engaged. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know no project is too big or small. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a Star Trek quote we could quote to boldly go. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that. Okay, you can move to the, the next slide, which is the end. <laughs> Kits everywhere. Yep. <laughs> They've been using your head everywhere. Well, and so I encourage, um, so first of all, um, thank you. You know, thank you students for taking time out of the week before, I mean, this is the week before the last week of classes, and um, and all of you are graduating, and, uh, um, you know, you might want to put your email contact address in there, if you only if you want to, in case anybody wants to reach you to, to reach out for job prospects. Um, so, audience, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A, and while you are doing so, I'm going to read off a few more advice quotes. Um, so, Christopher says, this is uh, advice from, you know, like after you're out in the world, um, your real education begins when you tackle real world projects in industry. And so this is the beauty of the enterprise because these are industry real world projects. Uh, and uh, that's what's so special about the enterprise programs at Michigan Tech and in particular the you know, the wireless communication enterprise. Um, thanks, thanks, Christopher. Um, Joe, Joe Corso says, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a good one. And then uh, Paul remembers Dr. Rundman, who taught big T over little t for foundry key learning. Do we know what that means? I don't. All right. And then, uh, so Kit, why don't, why don't you read off Harry's questions about the LED fan? Okay, so you'll have to uh, chime in here, Ken. Can the LED fan be used to watch your favorite movie or simplify fax equipment? Uh, I'm not too certain about simplifying fax equipment. And then for favorite movie, like, yes, it would take a while for the processor to turn like every frame of a movie down into you know the proper RGB components and then putting out the SD card and putting it up. The SD card we're using right now is 32 gigabytes of space. So uh, we could do that. I'm not sure how, too much about the granularity, you know, like 4K movies are all big on the big screen. And this is an LED fan with like, it'd be, it's like 100 by 100 for a display. So, uh, you know, your normal monitor on a computer might be 1920 by 1080. So comparatively, uh, the quality is a bit lower, but uh, you should be able to. There won't be any sound, but uh, you can at least see it. So. And so ultimately, Paul wants to ask, what's the purpose of the LED fan, Ken? Uh, so originally, this project started because 
in the past, WC has had a, a nice display piece carnival game where there's a big circle and there's uh, light bulbs around the edges. And if you hit a button when the light bulb's at the top, you know, you win. It flashes. It's all nice and pretty. Uh, over the years, it has fallen apart or fallen into disrepair a little bit. And it keeps taking more and more frequent repairs. And every time it gets repaired, it gets a little bit like less professional looking in the back end. You know, you open it up and it's there's just these wire jumbles everywhere. So uh, part of the goal for this project when we started off, uh, we didn't know we were going to do an LED fan at first. We just, uh, you know, we're like, oh, it's a, it's a wild card project. Uh, we basically had a lot more students than we had sponsored projects. So it's like, okay, we need to sit down and, uh, you know, think of something that would be useful for the enterprise to do or be useful for, you know, our learning purposes. So in the end, we decided on coming up with a new uh, display piece and then we got to here. So pretty much the, the simple answer, the purpose is because it's cool. Uh, <laughs> it's cool and it's a nice thing to show off. Like, wow, look at this thing we did. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Paul went on to um, explain that big T is temperature, typically temperature squared, little t is time. Okay. Temperature and time. Sounds like a, you know, a materials person. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, the word, the tie-in of Star Trek and the program being called Enterprise, I'm not sure that was, you know, that was certainly for me the, the big thing that, um, you know, I loved, I loved Star Trek and every time, it doesn't matter that I've been doing this for 15 years, but every time on Thursday night when it's time to go to the general meeting and like, it's time to go to Enterprise, there's just a small part of me that still thinks a little bit about Star Trek, so... Um, so the next question is what majors take part in WCE? So I think um, we have represented here one computer engineer, one electrical and computer engineer, Ken. And then yep. Michael, are you both as well or just? Yes, I'm both. Okay. Um, and so being hosted in the electrical and computer engineering department, that largely is where we draw from. But we've definitely had computer science people, we've had software engineers, we've had uh, business people, we have a, we've had biomedical engineers. Um, we, were, we were searching really hard this past spring to, to, to pull like a technical, a scientific and technical communication person in for a, a specific project that we were working on. Um, <laughs> we've had some mechanical engineers who've done some uh, CAD work and, and mechanical design work for us. Um, and we're super open, open to having some additional uh, people come in to, to expand out what we can do because the real world is cross-disciplinary, right? It's, it's not just about the, the one discipline and what you're doing there. So um, we'd love to have some psychology majors and human factors people come in. Um, We'd love to have more programmers come in, more of those scientific and technical communication people come in and um, help us to, to get the message out and to do things more well-rounded. Well, and so Kit, you mentioned that the weekly meeting is Thursdays at 7 p.m. or something like that? Yes, yep. Well, didn't Star Trek start at Fridays at 7 p.m.? I remember correctly. I, I'm trying to remember what day of the week was it in 1969, 70, 71. That that's a little before my time. Oh. Uh, I, I I was I'm a next generation. Person. I did not. I know. So and that one was that one was uh, syndicated when I was growing up, and so it came on channel I think channel 50 in Detroit at midnight or maybe 11 o'clock, one of the two. So that's that's the one that I grew up watching during the pandemic. I started. <laughs> I started a project, I, alas, I did not complete it. I abandoned it, of trying to watch them all in time order. <laughs> wow. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't finish the project. <laughs> not, not in order in which they were created, but in time order, you know, like, you know, you know, which, yeah, there's a lot of them. So I, I abandoned yeah. that. I abandoned that. All right, other questions. Yes, Star Trek was on Fridays at eight or nine. Yeah, okay, I thought it was on Fridays. Thanks, Paul. Um, so the next question is definitely for the students. How do you manage your school life balance while being an enterprise? And to the best of your knowledge, how does it apply or compare to senior design? Yeah, so uh, from my point of view, like 
I'll talk a little bit about comparing to senior design despite me not being in senior design, you know, I'm here. Um, so since senior design is just your last two semesters, it's kind of, um, you know, you're on a project team with some people, you're uh, working for a company, like, I feel like you have a bit less control as compared to enterprise. And part of the reason you have more control on enterprise is because you're in this 30 to 40 man or 30 to 40 person team, like this large team, and then individually, you know, you're in, you're in smaller teams. And so that's uh, those smaller teams make you able to be like, oh, there's nine projects this semester. Let me, you know, I I'd like to be on this project in the fall. We always, or I mean, every semester we ask people what teams they want to be on and to the best of our ability, we assign you, know, you where you want to be. And part of the school life balance that factors into that is that since you're in this big 30 to 40 person team, uh, there's a lot of like camaraderie along the lines of like, oh, there's, you know, 30 to other 40 people I know that are all around in the, you know, ECE department. They're in similar classes as me. They've had the same professors. It's very nice to be able to talk to them. And so like for me personally, um, I think it's almost in a lot of cases more important who I'm working with as opposed to what it is I'm working on. And so enterprise has been very good for that or along that line of thinking in that, you know, I'm with a bunch of great people and there's a lot of, uh, you know, people I can always talk with and, and hang out with. So the school life balance for enterprise is kind of built in in that sense, because, you know, if you're hanging around the lab, there's always people that you can talk to and you get like a nice blend of both. Yeah, I uh, got to admit, I spent, I live in the lab basically almost. Um, I spent a lot of time here, um, especially last semester. We had just moved labs um, and I spent a lot of time organizing and cleaning this place. Um, and it's a great place just to be on campus, um, kind of out of my house because of COVID quarantine. I got sick of being stuck in my house. And so coming to campus and then seeing the other people in the enterprise, like stop by for pop and like chatting and uh, whatever. So um, regarding like comparing uh, enterprise and senior design, um, senior design is two semesters and enterprise to replace senior design is four semesters total. Um, so in my opinion, I think enterprise is kind of spread out a little bit. So senior design, um, one of my, my roommates had a senior design project that she met with her team every single night of the week. Mm -hmm. And that sounded just like a lot of work. And so enterprise, um, I mean, I work on the project, um, for probably four days out of the week. Um, but like, I don't have to meet with my team every night of the week. Um, and like, we still get a lot done, uh, but I think as a less time commitment, um, I guess it depends on what team you're on, obviously, and I'm um, comparing to what design team or senior design team. Um, but it's also nice that we have like a dedicated, this is just our enterprise lab. So it's just our, um, our space and all of the equipment that we can use for enterprise, so. So you all have a key to the lab access on our ID cards. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually there sunrise to sunset studying. Um, I think another nice thing about the enterprise uh, is that projects aren't bound to a single year, they can continue, they can extend as needed. So projects can can live a lot longer than I, I suppose a traditional senior design project could. Um, and if you're in the enterprise starting before uh, your four semesters, that means you could be on a project for quite a long time and watch its entire development. And I think that's an opportunity you might not be able to get with just senior design. Well, and to just ch chime in, I mean, so we're talking about some tech, some sort of educational technical stuff. So um, in engineering degree programs that are ABET accredited, um, we are required to have a culminating senior um, design activity. These are often two semester projects, often six credits, right? Two, three credit courses where students are applying um, the prerequisite knowledge that they learned, you know, you know, the science and math and the all it, you know, to solve a, you know, a culminating project. And so um, it can be a very intense year and it's a very good experience whether either, either, way, either path you choose, but what enterprise offers, um, what I'm hearing you say is extended camaraderie, you know, right? So instead of having one year of, of like a really focused team experience, sort of extended camaraderie where you can shift and, and move around and work with a whole bunch of different people across that two year sequence. 
And um, something else that's intangible and, uh, you know, and, and it, it sounds like it's community is kind of what I'm hearing um, you all say. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, you know, there's just a few more questions, Kit. Do you want to see if there's any more we should take? Sure. Um, I guess I, I will. Another piece of career advice we got was never stop learning. And that is, um, that's a really good one. And uh, it also really just is a big part of what we do um, because not everything that happens in the enterprise is even taught in courses. We don't teach XBs in courses. We don't teach um, doing electromagnetic uh, simulation of things. And so the students have to learn. Um, and that's, that's really good stuff. Um, one more for the students, and then I'll take this last one from Harry. But um, <laughs> so Ken and Michael were both involved in FIRST Robotics. And do you think people should do it, give it a try? Um, and what if you're not particularly math minded? I think you should absolutely try it. That was a pivotal opportunity for me that let me really realize what I wanted to do. Um, and math minded isn't, I, I, I say, a prereq. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily related. It, it isn't, for first robotics especially, um, you're, worrying about working with the team and, and, and designing a robot according to some task that could have things that are mathematically oriented, but you've also got um, the business side of it. Uh, you've, got, you've got to manage a, an income set coming in from sponsors on those teams to be able to let your, your enterprise continue over time. And um, I think all in all, no matter what your interests are, it's, probably one of the best experiences you can have in high school before college. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, to go on a little bit about what if you're not particularly math minded, even from the point of view for when you're, you know, prototyping and designing, the way I saw it is that generally there are two types of people in, in our first robotics or two different ways we approach problem solving. There was the first way where you could sit down and like do all the physics and math and figure out like, oh, you know, the ball's gonna have this trajectory, we're gonna have this much force going in, we're gonna do this and that. Uh, but you only have six weeks to get stuff done. So very frequently it was like, all right, let's tape some stuff on there and see what happens. You know, like we just kind of <laughs> ran with it. So uh, there wasn't that much math mindedness until after the six week, this is when you're allowed to build period ended. And then you could sit down and figure out like, okay, we know all our parameters are like this. Let's see what it's actually supposed to be able to do now. Uh, so <laughs> that first six week period is a lot of fun where you're just, you know, slapping stuff together and seeing what happens. Uh, I can see in addition for like, if you want to get involved in programming, uh, there can be some like, I guess, complicated math things that happen in programming like PID control loops, but typically there's other ways to approach problems that don't involve that. And also not every student involved needs to know how the PID loop on the robot works for controls. You know, like you can just kind of, not everyone needs to know everything. That's why you're on a team. So yes, I agree. It's, it's very important. Uh, it's definitely has helped me a lot <laughs> in pretty much everything I've done up at tech relating to either like working in a team, talking to people, you know, there's a big social aspect of it in robotics, uh, anything related to engineering. It's, I can't stress enough how much I like agree with uh, Mike on like, you should just try it out. You know, if you don't like it, you can stop afterwards, but at least, you know, try it out. Um, just as a um, voice of somebody who wasn't um, able to do robotics in high school, um, my school didn't have a very welcoming robotics team. Um, and so I was unable um, to join that, um, unfortunately. And I think I would have, um, enjoy the experience, but I don't think it's required for um, somebody to succeed at tech um, it, uh, for them to be a part of robotics. Um, I learned so much my first year at tech, it was like information dump. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed um, learning all of that in my first classes. Um, I think robotics is a great place uh, for people to learn like this, that kind of stuff. Um, and like Ken and Michael said, Mike said, um, like the, that team aspect. Um, of learning, but there's also um, other areas that um, if you're unable to be on a, ro a robotics team, um, there's areas here at Tech that um, you're able to get a similar experience. I absolutely agree. It's it's not required. It's nice to be able to, to do, I guess, get exposure, but in no way required. So, uh, uh, 
Harry asked something from from my point of view as a uh, as the advisor. Do they have to turn in technical reports, milestones, stuff like that? And the answer is absolutely. So at the very least, at the end of each semester, the teams provide a final reports and a final presentation of what they did. Um, but we really try to make it work like a company. So there's weekly check ins. There's uh, final presentations, there's budget requests that are made, they keep track of their budgets, they keep track of their hours um, that they're they're working. We have project management software, we've got our Slack channels that are running that we do our communications. Um, you know, everything that I learned from the, the time that I was in industry, um, I brought to the enterprise when I came back to advise it. And um, it was uh, and and we look like a little company, and that's and and that's always been the goal, I think. So, well, outstanding. Um, there's there's just one small technical question. Can somebody explain what PID is? Um, Word S. What is yeah. it? Yeah. So uh, the PID loop for the programming side of things. Uh, PID stands for proportional, integral, and derivative. And so basically, if you have let's say your goal is this is i'm gonna this is directly like what a task was in one of the first robotics games was you have you know like 40 little eight inch diameter wiffle balls that you're trying to shoot upwards into a, a goal right and you want to shoot each one at the same speed and you want to shoot them as fast as possible in the sense that like you want to get through all 50 of them in like a second um every time you go to shoot one your wheel speed will drop a bit because now you know it's it's undergoing torque it's like you know it's trying to do something so it slows down a bit so if you're trying to get through all of the balls really fast, the next one's going to fire a little bit less far. And the next one's going to fire a little less far because of all of the extra stress being placed on the motor, trying to spin the wheels to shoot the balls. So your PID loop enables it that way uh, based on the change in speed the motor undergoes, how fast and how uh, extreme the response is to you know, increase power to the motor so that way it starts spinning faster. So. There's, there can be there can be a lot of complex math in that, or you can only do parts of it and get it, you know, in a simplified version. But it's just a big uh, controls loop where you have an encoder reading how fast the wheel is spinning, and then based on the parameters you set, when it slows down a little bit, it can either immediately jump up the voltage a lot to get it to spin a lot faster, and then you know there's a lot of uh, trial and error that goes into figuring it out, uh, you know, how to get your PID loop calculated. Or there's a lot of math you can do, but again, uh, short time constraints and high school students. So we're just like, all right, let's change the I value, see what happens. You know, we know when we change I, this typically happens, you know, and then we go through and test it out. So hopefully that's a good enough explanation for what you're looking for. Ken, um, you, you're, you're a born teacher. Yeah, <laughs> you should consider getting a doctorate degree and becoming a university professor. If, if I had had somebody explain control theory that clearly and simply, I might have done better in that class. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to take one more question. This one's for Kit. Um, Kit, can you please tell us about your teaching philosophy, both in class and during the, the enterprise? So we'll do the, the easy one first, and that's uh, how, how things work during the enterprise. And essentially, I see myself as the kind of a combination chairman of the board slash uh, technical architect or something like that. Uh, someone that... Um, basically just make sure that people are moving in the right direction and they continue moving. But on the other side, um, being the one that says, okay, did you think about this? Did you try this? Can you give me a little more information? Maybe you should go talk to professor X, Y, or Z because they do what you do. You're, you're struggling with here and they'll, they'll, they'll be able to help you out. So that's, that's the big uh, idea with enterprise with, with the other regular classes, I think the, the first thing is that my if it wasn't clear from the fact that I am really completely okay with being badly photoshopped onto things, um, my my one of my very big things is just because it's important doesn't mean it has to be serious. Um, and so class people have last uh, spring, I had a civil engineer email me saying her boyfriend was in my network security class and she watched just because it was entertaining. She enjoyed the material, the material, even though she didn't have a necessarily completely understand what we were talking about because it was fun to, to be a part of it. I think she also liked when my cat made guest appearances in the zoom meetings, but, um, 
Uh, that's the biggest thing. It's it's make make the material you know be the most be the most excited person in the room. Make sure it's technically accurate. Make sure it's technically relevant. My particular area requires being kept up to date. You know, when you're teaching networks and you're teaching processor architecture and you're teaching network security, you can't teach that from a 2005 point of view. You have to keep it up to date, and so. Um, that idea of constantly learning is I get paid to learn and that's the best thing in the world. I get to learn like a couple of years ago, I sat down to learn blockchain because I could and my, the students wanted to learn about it. So um, have fun with it just because it's important doesn't mean it has to be serious. Keep it relevant and, and be the most excited person in the room. Those are kind of the three big things that I try to do, so. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Uh, Kid is one of our, our just, you know, precious, precious faculty members here who inspires our students. So I don't know if you can hear my, I have a guitar, a bass guitar playing in the background, but um, it's been so wonderful hanging out with you this evening. I, I do, since, you know, it's obvious all of you are kind of gifted teachers and um, communicators. Um, I, I hope you all know that graduate school uh, in the United States, right? And so a couple of you are considering what to do when you're in graduate, you know, if you get in, if you get involved with doing a funded research project with a professor, graduate school is not only free, they pay you, okay? This is a little known fact to somehow to US students, but so you could earn enough money to live on and save a little and pay for your broken cars, you know, and not do too shabbily, and get a PhD or a master's. And I started off with no intention of getting a PhD. I'm no, nobody in my family ever had a PhD. I was just, I was, I was graduating at, at the time when um, chemical engineers, so the price of oil had, had fallen. This is when OPEC kind of crashed around 1983. Uh, and I, you know, my, a faculty member who I had taken a class from, saw me kind of walking back to my residence hall in my little suit, because I'd gone for an interview, he says, hey, Janet, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I was like, I don't know, I'm looking for a job. He goes, come talk to me about grad school. And then the next thing you know, I was, I was enrolled, you know, in a graduate program being paid to do so. My tuition was paid, my health benefits were paid, and I was paid. Uh, and then that just turned into a PhD, because I, I, there's this myth that graduate school is harder than your undergraduate degree. Guess what, you guys? You have done the hardest thing you will ever do in your whole life by finishing up your undergraduate degree in engineering. So if anyone out there is listening and wondering kind of what to do in a pandemic, you know what? There's, there's no harm in getting an advanced degree. And do you need to have a 4.0 to go to grad school? No. You need to have a GPA of 3.0 or better to apply. And then just, you know, it's about the relationship with the professor or, you know, whether whether they need people. And right now, there's a whole bunch of openings because not very many international students can come in. And the international students come to the U.S. because they kind of know you get paid. And our own students, you know, should be should be taking advantage of that more. All right. So sorry, I went on a rant. You heard me have a rant. Thank you, everyone, this evening for joining us for Husky Bites, and uh, it has been my pleasure and honor to hear your stories and, and about your projects. Kit, um, you know, awe-inspiring, and, uh, and Abby and Ken and Mike, um, I wish you the very best, and I hope you keep in touch with us. And uh, out there as alumni, I hope you send us projects back to work on. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Good evening.